this is a, an auspicious occasion, the 50th anniversary of, of Haystack. And this is a facility uh, around which an observatory has grown and that ha has had uh, a tremendous impact on uh, a lot of different people over the years. Uh, and what we're going to be talking about today is uh, that history of five decades and a little bit of a look forward to uh, what will be a bright uh, and exciting future. So, um, without further ado, um, first of all, I, I'd like to say that uh, there's a number of people that uh, we're honored to have with us today. Um, we have uh, some members from the senior MIT administration, uh, Vice President for Research, Maria Zuba, Vice President Claude Canizaris and a number of other folks uh, from, from MIT uh, senior leadership. We also have uh, the uh, uh, many members from the uh, Lincoln Laboratory Director's Office on down through, through uh, the various groups and divisions. Uh, we also have with us today uh, two members of the uh, Massachusetts House of Representatives and a number of uh, officials from the surrounding towns of Westford, Cotton, and Tingsborough. So, uh, a couple of words about the agenda, if we could have the, the first slide. Well, actually, the second slide. So, uh, this is uh, just a little bit of information about logistics today. We're in the big tent on the right, uh, in red, uh, and uh, we have uh, a number of uh, facilities or a number of, of uh, presentations and uh, uh, exhibits in the main conference room at, uh, in the main Haystack building and also in the library. The antenna, which is a centerpiece, is, is right there. And as we uh, exit the tent after the presentations this afternoon, uh, we'll just go out in this fashion. Uh, I uh, obviously recommend spending a bit of time looking at this magnificent instrument that's been built over the past few years, uh, the antenna. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to move it today because uh, we don't have enough hard hats to, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, to deal with that. So, um, if you have any uh, questions or uh, concerns or things that you need, there are a number of event staff uh, uh, milling around the, uh, the gathering. You can identify them by the tags around their necks. So please don't hesitate to do that. This is a, a remarkable uh, opportunity for old friends to reunite and for new, mem new memories to be made. And there are also photographers uh, who will be mingling throughout the afternoon. And I encourage you to take the opportunity to uh, have group photographs taken uh, as your sense of occasion uh, uh, dictates and we'll make all of the, f the photographs from this event available online for anybody to download uh, later on. So as you came in, you will have hopefully been given uh, some items, a, a commemorative coin and a, a brochure uh, that covers the, uh, the history of Haystack and some of the details of the antenna that's been constructed but also uh, for something that's rather more detailed and technical, there is a special issue of the Lincoln Laboratory Journal. Uh, and uh, I'd uh, like to say a few things first about the, uh, the coin, uh, just to illustrate. Uh, th this illustrates three components of, uh, of Haystack and its history. Uh, in the top left, you can see this is the Orion Nebula. Uh, in, uh, in optical wavelengths, but when you look at radio wavelengths, you can see emission lines and absorption lines from molecules in interstellar space. And Haystack Observatory and the 37 meter telescope was very heavily involved in the early days of astrochemistry, so this is symbolic of one of the many research areas that the telescope has enabled. Uh, down to the right, that is uh, a picture of the 
Skylab space station from the 1970s, and Eric Evans, the Lincoln Lab director, will say a little bit more about Haystack's role with respect to that. And finally, there is the Earth in the foreground. Many aspects of Haystack research, including with the 37-meter dish, uh, have led to improved understandings of the planet that we live on. So that's the symbolism there. So the origins of Haystack. Um, back in the 1950s, we were in the middle of a Cold War and the threat of uh, nuclear attack was a very real thing. So there was a lot of uh, emphasis on trying to get advanced radar capabilities. And the first uh, facility built on the site was the Millstone Hill radar, which you can see right there. Um, but shortly after that, there was a recognized need for a more uh, powerful and larger facility. Uh, and that led to the concept of the, of the haystack antenna. It needed to be uh, more powerful and higher gain than the existing dish. Um, and one of its primary purposes uh, in the design phase was for long distance communication. The specifications called for operating at a frequency of 8 gigahertz with a diameter of 37 meters. And uh, the initial cost estimates for that were too high for the Air Force to support. The estimated cost of that instrument was $5 million. Um, so the answer that was found to reduce the cost to something more manageable was to place the entire structure inside a radome, thereby protecting it from the sun, from wind, and from snow loading, allowing the antenna itself to be built uh, in a much more lightweight and therefore less expensive fashion. Uh, and so the cost was reduced by a factor of several. Um, so as we look through the uh, construction pictures here, uh, going back, this is the 2nd of November 1959, which is essentially when the project started. And, uh, and Herb Weiss was appointed the project engineer uh, for, for this telescope. Uh, and over the next roughly five years, the construction proceeded. This is uh, the radome starting to take shape and the panels being placed on the radome. Uh, and uh, one of the major challenges was the reflector surface of that original dish. The target surface accuracy was roughly one millimeter RMS variations uh, over 37 meters, which was at the time quite a formidable technological challenge. Um, the, uh, the antenna was constructed inside the radome. The radome went up first and then the antenna was built inside the radome. And this is the, uh, the yoke uh, under construction back in those days. And after it was finished, this is the field site Roughly in 1964, uh, the resulting um, antenna had a, an RMS surface accuracy of slightly better than one millimeter, which made it among the finest antennas in the world. And uh, it was 50 years ago, almost to the day, October the 8th, 1964, that Herb Weiss stood up on a podium in front of hundreds of people and talked about the newly inaugurated telescope. And I can think of nothing more fitting than 50 years, plus or minus 10 days later, for the very same Herb Weiss to come up to a podium in front of hundreds of people and tell us about those early pioneering days. So Herb. Well, thank you, Colin. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. Uh, 50 years seem to have uh, passed very rapidly, but uh, being back at Haystack reminds me of the very early days. Uh, it was decided that uh, after the Soviets dropped a hydrogen bomb in the Arctic on Tess, that the U.S. was vulnerable to an attack, and particularly our retaliatory force, which was the SAC aircraft, uh, could be surprised on the ground. And that motivated 
the president of the, UN, of the United States to call the president of MIT on a one-to-one -one call and say, you've got to work on this problem. It's, you've done so well during World War II on the radar work. Put the lab together and solve this continental air defense problem. And of course, that was the tall order, but uh, that's the way the message came out. Uh, the Lincoln Laboratory was set, set up in 1951, and uh, after looking at the problem for a while, uh, we thought we understood it, and then lo and behold, Sputnik showed up. And instead of looking for uh, aircraft, we were looking for space objects. We had to find an ICBM coming over the Arctic at 3,000 miles because that would give us 30 minutes of warning for SAC. Well, we scratched our head in the lab for a long time and decided it only required 60 dB more capability than we had going. That's a million times. That was an astronomical challenge. So we grabbed all the numbers and we looked at it and talked about it and said, well, if you build antennas as big as an acre or two and you get transmitters as big as the Voice of America had, and if you've used computer processing, uh, you might be able to get pretty close to that. So we put, problem came together and we decided, okay, we're gonna start putting a system together that would see long, long range objects. And, and uh, it soon became apparent, that you needed a place to test this stuff. So we set up some requirements. We wanted a test site close to the lab. We wanted a place that was not occupied, had no houses within five miles. And believe it or not, 50 miles, 50 years ago, there were literally no houses within five miles of this site. Well, we found a location, and uh, as you came up the hill this afternoon, you saw that 84 foot dish and a big a great metal building and that was the test site for the uh, components that eventually came into the missile detection system well the lab uh, jumped on that problem and did an extraordinarily good job uh, when we got all through a system was built up in the arctic came through on budget and came through on schedule which is unheard of for something that take a step forward. After that task, the question is, what are we going to do in the radar group in the lab? What's our next challenge? And we thought of it about a while and said, well, space objects are going to be around. We better build something that can detect what's going on in space. That led us in the direction of higher frequencies and uh, better processing and so forth. More Discrimination was a big issue. Well, it didn't take much effort to decide that now we had a site at Sace to Haystack, it would be advantageous to find another site nearby. And that's why walking around the Haystack site, we ended up here on uh, this site, which is called uh, up the road from Millstone Hill. Uh, the system uh, went together primarily as a advancement of the technology. There was no major operational requirement. Just do the best you can. Let's stretch the technology in every direction we can. And lo and behold, we were scratching our head about this. A call came in from an Air Force colonel saying, Herb, we have a radome that we can't use. It's in, we're paying storage out in Goodyear in, in the, Ohio, can you possibly use it? We thought about it and said, well, we're looking for something to, to uh, enclose this antenna, and that's why we have this 150-foot diameter radar. That set some of the parameters for the system. So, uh, well, things went uh, pretty well, and, and uh, I guess, uh, the results for early history. You can see what's going on and, and how well it's grown. And at the time, we knew it was way at the frontier of state-of-the-art. 
and today it still seems to be. So we're very gratified by that, and it's indeed a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Herb. That was terrific. Um, so, certainly one of the things that Haystack was built for was for long-distance communications. Um, but um, at the time, communication satellites were just coming into their own. And so that, uh, as a primary purpose for the Haystack antenna, uh, seemed less attractive. But this was a very versatile system that had been built and it could be turned to a wide variety of, of other applications. Uh, at the time, uh, in the early days of, of the operating Haystack facility, Paul Sebring was the site supervisor and then uh, later on uh, became the first uh, Haystack Observatory uh, director. Uh, and in those early days, the planetary radar system was uh, a, a major thing. So one of the things that that planetary radar system did was make detailed radar maps of the lunar surface. And in fact, some of that radar imaging of the lunar surface was pivotal in the selection of Apollo landing sites. Uh, but not only could you image the moon, you could image the planets as well. And this is a radar image of the surface of Venus. Even more fundamental though than that, was a measurement uh, whereby you bounce radio waves off a planet like Venus, and then you wait for the echo and you see how long it takes. Then you see how that time varies as the planet goes close to the sun. And it turns out that Einstein's general theory of relativity predicts a very specific delay, ex excess delay in that round trip radio signal. Uh, and that led to uh, the so-called fourth test of general relativity, measuring that round trip excess delay to very high accuracy using the high power transmitter, uh, the large aperture and high gain of the haystack antenna and very precise timing. And this is the result uh, that was obtained uh, in uh, one of the uh, seminal experiments uh, and only Haystack could observe the, uh, the, the point where Venus got closest to the Sun. The blue line here is Einstein's prediction, and the black points are the data that were taken. This was, uh, uh, for the time, an extraordinarily high accuracy uh, confirmation of general relativity. Or to be a little bit more precise, this is a measurement that demonstrated that Einstein was still not necessarily wrong. So um, the team that did this was, was led by Erwin Shapiro. And uh, there he is uh, in the front, Gordon Pettengill behind him and the other members of the team uh, in front of the, of the haystack dish. Uh, and uh, while it's, it's unfortunate that Erwin himself uh, could not be here today, uh, he is having to endure the rigors of Paris, France. Uh, but he was able to record a short video uh, with which to address the, the people here today, so. Greetings. I always love visiting Haystack. Being there with its staff just makes me feel good. So I am particularly sad at not being there today to see all of you who meant and mean so much to Haystack and to me personally especially Herb Weiss, who is largely responsible for Haystack's being here. Haystack, along with its magically talented engineers and scientists, have played a prominent part in my life, from being the foundation for the fourth test of general relativity, the basis for remarkable studies by radar of asteroids, comets, the moon and planets, the linchpin for the discovery of superluminal motion of jets and quasars, to the major development and application of geodetic VLBI, 
and the resulting major contributions to geodesy and geophysics. While celebrating Haystack's first half century of accomplishments, you should also look forward to its future accomplishments, which are made possible by its extremely talented staff and superior leadership. It's true, I've used a lot of superlatives in these brief remarks, but each and every one is on the mark. From afar though I may be, I salute you all. Owen, of course, has been a tremendous and steadfast friend uh, throughout the history of Haystack, and uh, we're all very sorry that he can't be here today, but uh, thank you, Owen, for that, uh, that lovely video. So Owen mentioned VLBI. That stands for Very Long Baseline Interferometry, and VLBI has been a mainstay of Haystack technology and technical development and scientific accomplishment for decades. Uh, and uh, that work in VLBI, that leadership in VLBI, uh, continues to this day. So VLBI, just in a nutshell, uh, is when you take multiple antennas, sometimes separated by thousands of miles, the, almost the entire diameter of the Earth, and you observe the same object, and that you combine the signals, and with this technique, it is possible to obtain extreme angular resolution on the sky that makes the Hubble Space Telescope look very blurry indeed. The only problem is you have to have a radio source to look at. Uh, and those are a bit fewer and far between than the things that the Hubble can see. But nevertheless, that extreme resolution is an extraordinary thing. And when it was first deployed in full force, one of the things that came out of the woodwork pretty early was this. This is a result uh, in a paper that was led by Alan Whitney, who has been a leading member of the Haystack community for over 40 years, uh, and he, uh, he served a, a stint as interim director at Haystack, and incidentally he was primarily responsible for the uh, article in the Lincoln Laboratory Special Issue Journal uh, that chronicles some of the major scientific accomplishments. Uh, at Haystack Observatory over the years that includes the fourth test of general relativity, this result, and several others. So what you're looking at here, uh, this, is, this is just a curve of uh, interferometric response, but what really matters is this one. It shows that the separation between two components in a quasar is increasing with time. And if you work out how fast that is, it turns out to be about 26 times the speed of light. Um, that uh, might be a little bit discomforting to some, uh, but yet again, Einstein is not wrong, or at least not necessarily wrong. This is, however, evidence that something is moving very, very close to the speed of light, and furthermore, that it is directed very close to the line of sight. And that results in uh, essentially an apparent motion that is much greater than the speed of light. So this caused uh, quite, quite a stir. So there are many, uh, many scientific endeavors like this that occurred in the first 15 or 20 years of, of uh, Haystack's operation. And all of that work was overseen by uh, the first uh, site director, Paul Sebring, and then director of Haystack Observatory when Haystack was separated from Lincoln Laboratory as a separate entity in 1970. And uh, Paul's uh, children, Gus and Ellen, are in the audience today, somewhere. There we go. Um, and uh, Paul, unfortunately, was unable to travel to this, uh, to this event. But again, he was able to record a short video uh, for us here today. Well, first of all, I, I want to really uh, thank Alan Whitney for the labor of love that he extended in, in uh, putting together that, that history of, of Haystack. Uh, I'm surprised it goes as far as it does. Uh, I wish I understood all of it. 
but it's a, it's a jumping off place for me anyway. At least I know some of the questions I need to ask. So anyway, thanks again, Alan, and thanks to all the stalwart people, stalwart people of the observatory for having the stamina to put it all together. So God bless and I'll see you later. Bye. So, in addition to the operations with the 37 meter dish that were so active in those days, uh, also something that started at about the second time was a technique called incoherent scatter radar. And the big transmitter that was attached to the 84 foot dish uh, at Millstone, uh, that power could be uh, coupled with a very large aperture and fired off into the upper atmosphere. Uh, and if you fired enough energy off and had a sensitive enough receiver to pick up the echoes, you could pick up the faint echoes from electrons high up in the atmosphere, in fact, in the ionosphere. And this became a very powerful remote sensing uh, technique that, uh, that was done on the site for, uh, well, since the, since the mid-1960s. Uh, John Evans was a key figure uh, in, in that work in the early days, and he also was a Haystack director from 1980 to 1983. John, unfortunately, had a conflict uh, and is unable to be with us today, um, but uh, he uh, should be proud of the fact that the, uh, this work uh, on the ionosphere and the uh, atmospheric sciences uh, has thrived without a break for 50 years and is thriving today. Uh, the atmospheric sciences uh, efforts at Haystack Observatory have become very tightly integrated with the rest of the observatory. Uh, and uh, this is one of the key ingredients to Haystack's prosperity today. So one of the things that made the 37 meters so versatile uh, and therefore scientifically powerful was the system of interchangeable boxes. So you see here a, an instrumentation box being hoisted up into the focal position. And in this way, it was possible to efficiently share the astronomy operations on the dish that require sensitive passive receivers with the Lincoln Laboratory radar capabilities on the same dish. Uh, and that, uh, that cooperation and dual use turned out to be very powerful over the years. So one of the things that was a, a major uh, focus of research in the 80s and 90s with the telescope was looking at regions of our galaxy that are filled with gas and dust in interstellar space and also molecules. On the left, you can see um, the Orion Nebula. This is actually the same picture that's on the, on the coin, on the commemorative coin. And uh, to the right, you see uh, the, the Perseus molecular cloud complex. And uh, these molecules emit and absorb radiation right in the frequency range that this telescope was sensitive to. Uh, and it turns out that the higher in frequency you go, the more of this stuff that you can see. And Haystack at the time was one of the finest high frequency antennas in the world. And so it was a, uh, a pioneering instrument uh, for opening up the new field of astrochemistry. And many molecules were found with the Haystack telescope and people like Phil Myers and Priscilla Benson and many others were heavily involved in that work. Um, another individual who was deeply engaged in that, uh, in that work um, was uh, a staff astronomer here for many years, Aubrey Hashik. Uh, and I, I, is Aubrey here today? Aubrey's over there. So yeah, welcome back, Aubrey. And uh, it was tremendous work uh, back in those, those days. So. Here's a list, by the way, uh, as of 
about a decade ago of all the different molecules that had been identified in space. There's a huge number of them. This is the, the number of atoms in the molecules. Huge variety and now an enormous and very productive research field. So another thing that was going on in those times, uh, the 80s and the 90s, was geodetic VLBI. So VLBI can achieve extraordinary angular resolution on the sky, but you can turn that around and say, okay, if, if the radio source is in a certain position on the sky, I can figure out exactly where my telescopes are on the ground. And this turns out that you can do that to a precision of millimeters over thousands of miles. And what this allows you to do is for the first time, directly measure continental drift. And what you see here is the separation between uh, a telescope here on the site and a telescope in Germany. And it turns out that uh, America and Europe are drifting apart at a few centimeters a year, which makes some people very happy. <laughs> what, uh, what I don't quite understand, though, is if you look at a map, that means that Europe's moving to the right and America's moving to the left. And that, uh, that does not compute, except uh, if you consider Deep Blue Massachusetts and David Cameron's United Kingdom. <laughs> this is a map of all the tectonic plate motions that were mapped out by VLBI in this pioneering work. Uh, and it led to a really profound improvement in our understanding of the dynamics of the solid Earth. Haystack was also involved and continues to be involved in the development of cutting-edge VLBI technology. And at Haystack was uh, responsible for much of the design of the very long baseline array that was commissioned in about 1990 and is run by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Uh, this was a time of change and of challenge when this network of dedicated telescopes went online, Haystack no longer was responsible for operating the ad hoc VLBI network that had been running up to that point. In addition, um, as fine as the Haystack telescope was with its one millimeter RMS surface accuracy, there were new telescopes being built all over the world on mountain tops with higher surface accuracies and the competitiveness of Haystack for astronomy was being challenged. One of the responses to this in the early 1990s was the construction of, or the upgrade of the telescope to be able to operate at three millimeters. And this is a picture of a deformable subreflector. So the radiation comes in, it bounces off the dish, it hits the subreflector and bounces to the receivers. And by changing the shape of the subreflector, you can take out some of the distortions in the dish. In addition, there was a, a thermal control system that would selectively heat and cool different parts of the dish to further take out some distortions. And this, uh, it, it, I think it's fair to say, added at least a decade to the competitive life of the, uh, of the 37 meter dish for astronomical studies. We also, at that time, because of these challenges, uh, went for diversification of research. And this is a trend, this diversification is something that continues unabated today. One of the directions uh, to take an example was uh, the low frequency arrays. So we participated in the construction of a low frequency array in Western Australia. Uh, we are currently heavily engaged in technology development for new kinds of low frequency arrays, in this case, a portable one that is a real revolution in the making. Uh, and also, uh, we have uh, engagement in an experiment to uh, search for uh, emission or a, a signature uh, from the very early stages of the universe, a phase change in the universe. And this work is led at Haystack by Alan Rogers. Alan Rogers, of course, uh, I could have put his face on just about every slide up to now because his contributions have been uh, continuous, profound, uh, spanned every single one of the five decades that Haystack has been in existence. Uh, and uh, his, his mark is on all of the major accomplishments of the observatory. And we all owe him a tremendous uh, amount of gratitude for his, his pivotal contributions over the years.
So in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, um, it was a period of both uh, trial, but also great triumph. For nearly half the time since the inauguration of the telescope in 1964, and for more than half of the life of Haystack Observatory as a separate entity, Joe Salah was the director here, was, was our leader, and it is in large part to him that we owe what Haystack is today. Uh, he hired me in 1986 and became a friend and mentor, and I would like to invite Joe to the podium now to say a few words. Thank you, Colin, and uh, thank you, uh, Colin and Eric, for inviting me to this celebration and give me an opportunity to say a few words about the time when, when I was here. Uh, it's good to be back after five years of retirement and to find that the observatory is in good hands and is still prospering. So I missed you all during these five years. Maybe I should be more honest. I, I missed most of you. <laughs> I also thought of you often, but if I should be again honest, I thought of you sometimes in the winter months, January, February, when I watched on TV people shoveling all that snow while I was sitting relaxing in Southern California. But then of course, we got the droughts, the fires, and the earthquakes, so I stopped relaxing, and I'm glad to be back here. So, on a more serious note, I'm proud to have been part of Haystack for 25 years, half of its lifetime, 23 of those as its third director, building on the strong foundations that were laid by Paul Sebring and John Evans. The staff got a lot done during those, those years while I was there. Now you have a wonderful new dish that will do exceptional measurements and push the frontier forward. Our time was spent, as Colin said, pushing a grand old antenna well beyond its initial design frequency of 8 gigahertz. And that's because it was so well designed and built by Herb Weiss and his team at Lincoln Laboratory. I recall the ingenuity that went to upgrading that old dish to operate first around 20 gigahertz. Then we were pushing to 50 gigahertz. And then we bravely tackled upgrading it to 115 gigahertz. And we were successful in that. The upgrade work was done by our engineers here were led by the late Dick Ingalls, with excellent support from Simpson, Gumperts, and Hager, led by Joe and Tebby. And as our astronomers, many of whom uh, Colin already mentioned, from Haystack, the MIT campus, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and other institutions in the Northeast, then used the telescope to observe the emission of various molecules in interstellar space to study star formation. And then the telescope participated in VLBI networks, first at centimeter wavelength, then pioneered millimeter wavelengths to map galaxies with finer and finer resolution. And Haystack basically became an international center of excellence in VLBI technology and science, which continues to, to today. So I'd like to mention a few important attributes of Haystack from my former perspectives. First, a key strength of our observatory has been the combination of technology and science. The technology often enabled new science to be done, and other times the science drove the development of the necessary technology. I'll give you two examples. One example is the innovation of this innovation was the development of high data recording by Alan Whitney and his group to enable cutting edge millimeter wave VLBI astronomy as well as the precise measurements of geodetic motion in the Earth's crustal, uh, crustal dynamics, as Colin mentioned. Second example was a successful search for deuterium by Alan Rogers and his team, which drove the development of radio array technology, which was then later applied to large wide field arrays. The second attribute that I would like to note here, and of which I was most proud during my tenure, was the contribution of the staff to education. So we use the resources of the observatory to enrich undergraduate students through hands-on research opportunities. And we reached out to the communities around us to help excite young students and their teachers towards science, math, and engineering. And these programs continue today. 
Alan Rogers and his group even cleverly designed and commercialized small radio telescopes for education, which I understand from my visit today, continue to be used around the country and the world quite successfully. And finally, I would like to personally recognize the Atmospheric Sciences Group, which is part of Haystack. Over 50 years ago, the first incoherent scatter spectrum was measured uh, by the Millstone Hill radar down the hill, and the work still continues to make major contributions to the study of the Earth's ionosphere, upper atmosphere, and magnetosphere. Now, I still remember with great fondness my own three years as an MIT graduate student here on the hill in the late 60s working on my thesis using those radars down the hill at Millstone under the men mentorship of John Evans. So in retrospect, I look at the various important tasks that a director does, like raising funds, developing strategic plans, entertaining committees and sponsors. But the most important task, in my view, for a director is bringing the right people and the best people to work here and creating a good work environment. So I am proud of the staff, the technical support personnel who have populated this facility over the years while I was here and produced all the successes and important results. Thank you for all that hard work and for your dedication. There's a kindred spirit that binds Haystack people together. Those of you that work here know, know that spirit that I'm talking about. It allows them to support each other and succeed. I've been told that this spirit is unequal among similar research centers. So this is something that we can, we can all be proud of and continue to nurture in the future. So congratulations on the 50th anniversary, and I give you my best wishes as you carry forward your research in the future at your traditional level of excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, those were tremendous years that you led us through for 23 years. Um, so next, I would uh, like to just uh, reiterate that Haystack Observatory shares um, a great deal of history, um, a, a culture of innovation, and a tightly knit community on the hill here which has both Lincoln Laboratory and Haystack Observatory facilities. So there's been a partnership between Lincoln and Haystack for, for decades, and that partnership today is as strong as it ever was. So uh, next I'd like to uh, introduce um, Maria Zuber, Vice President for Research at MIT, to say a few words. Thank you so much. Um, I am delighted on behalf of myself, but also President Reif and the rest of us at MIT, to add my congratulations to present and former members of Haystack on the occasion of this momentous event. Haystack is a special place for me personally, uh, this area. During my days of teaching observational astronomy, my students and I made weekly visits up to the Wallace Observatory on the adjacent grounds. Wallace is one of the many, many astronomical jewels of, uh, of this area. On nights when the skies were crystal clear and the atmospheric viewing conditions were excellent, the students would inevitably overrule me that class was over so that they could stay and observe well beyond the end of class time. I would routinely drive them back and drop them off at their dorms and their fraternities and sororities at campus and in Boston after midnight, at which time they'd start their homework. Observing space has that kind of effect on people. All I can say is that it's a good thing that I didn't let them near the 37-meter dish or I never would have been able to pry them away and take them back to campus. That little anecdote exemplifies one of so many ways that Haystack 
for years has added value to our programs. The observatory operates in the best MIT tradition of developing new technologies, applying them to gain new knowledge, and training the next generation of technologists and scientists. Haystack is a valued partner, along with MIT and Lincoln Lab, in the development of radar systems and other technologies for sensing phenomena from the drift of the Earth plates to the structure of the atmosphere to the interiors of galaxies. I applaud Haystack's, Haystack's broader commitment and contributions to education from postdocs, graduate students, undergraduates, teachers, and even the public at large. I'd also like to highlight the long and successful partnering between Haystack and Lincoln Lab, which has flourished nearly since Haystack's inception. The two organizations have exhibited a spirit of cooperation that transcends their distinctive missions and which has enriched them both, and of course MIT as well. In closing, when I start to think that Haystack is far away from us in Cambridge, I remind myself that it is so much closer than what it is we explore together. From our most recently selected experiment to synthesize rocket fuel on the surface of Mars, to our VLBI efforts to study the dynamics of the Earth using quasars at the edge of observable space, I know I speak for many at MIT in saying how privileged we have been to claim Haystack as a bright star in our constellation, and we look forward to what the future brings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, now I would like to uh, invite um, State House Representative Jim Osario to the podium uh, for a short presentation. Thank you very much. It's uh, quite an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, growing up in Westford and, and now having the honor to represent uh, the people of Westford in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, it's, it's such an honor knowing that uh, I grew up here in Westford and used to ride my bike and play in the woods around this area. And uh, certainly growing up, full, full mission here is that I wasn't quite sure what went on up here. But uh, as I grew older and uh, read the works of Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, Arthur C. Clarke, I got a better handle on what went on up here. <laughs> but the work that you do here uh, in innovation and scientific research uh, has certainly been a beacon of inspiration for not only our nation, but our world. And it's an honor to, to call uh, you know, Westford our home. So on behalf of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, uh, put forward a resolution honoring five decades of excellence Congratulating the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Haystack Observatory on the occasion of its 50th anniversary. Whereas the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Haystack Observatory, located in Westford, is celebrating its 50th year. Haystack Observatory is an astronomical observatory owned by Massachusetts Institute of Technology, located in Westford, and began operation in 1964. The Haystack Observatory Atmospheric Science Group pursues a broad spectrum of up, upper atmosphere research, including studies on Earth's thermosphere, ionosphere, and magnetosphere, and the process which couple and perturb these regions. Whereas the fourth test of Einstein's general theory of relativity was also carried out at Haystack by making precise measurements of the round trip travel time on the radar echo from Mercury, which passing near the sun was delayed due to the intense solar gravitational field. Whereas the Haystack Observatory is renowned for many astronomical discoveries, such as the initial detections of various molecular species and in inter, bear with me here, interterrestrial space. Whereas many as 100 investigators, including about 20 graduate students, utilize the facility annually in their research projects, therefore be it resolved that the Massachusetts House of Representatives joins the citizens of Westford and surrounding communities 
and celebrating the, mem the memorable occasion of 50, 50th anniversary of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Haystack Observatory, wishing it sincere best wishes for continued success and be it further resolved a copy of these resolutions be transmitted forthwith to the Clerk of the House of Representatives, signed by the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo and Jim Arcero. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you very much, Representative Marcerio. I'm also uh, very pleased to uh, have in my possession here um, a letter uh, from the uh, senior United States Senator from the state of Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren. And I'll just uh, read what it says here. I am honored to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Haystack Observatory. Thanks to a strong commitment to multidisciplinary research and innovation, the MIT Haystack Observatory has served as a world leader in radio science for 50 years. On behalf of citizens all across the Commonwealth, I congratulate the MIT Haystack Observatory on this landmark achievement. Signed, Elizabeth Warren. So, uh, we're almost at the end here of the presentations, uh, so I uh, wanted to say a few final words about what the future holds besides uh, food, drink, cake and merriment. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that Haystack has been working hard to diversify its science and technology portfolio and just to illustrate that briefly I've got a few pictures here. This is uh, low frequency array development that I mentioned earlier. This is a revolution that you can pick up this array, move it anywhere, set it down, and start taking pictures of the sky. Um, this represents a, a truly exciting flagship project at Haystack Observatory using this, this VLBI technique again, using telescopes all across the world, including uh, in California, in Mexico, in Hawaii, Chile and even the South Pole uh, operating at the unprecedentedly high frequency of 230 gigahertz, that's a wavelength of 1.3 millimeters, uh, in order to get enough angular resolution to start to resolve the structures caused by the intense gravity around supermassive black holes, including the one at the center of our own galaxy and this is work that is being led at Haystack by Assistant Director Shep Dolman. We are pushing into new uh, vistas of computer-aided um, research, computer-aided discovery. Uh, one of the projects that leverages this kind of work uh, is called Mahali, which turns out to be Swahili for everywhere, and this is a concept whereby using ordinary everyday devices, mobile devices that people have in their pockets, you can develop a very dense sensing network for the ionosphere above our heads. At the moment we have maybe hundreds of sensors around the world measuring the ionosphere, but by using advanced computational techniques and, and software techniques and crowdsourcing techniques, we can turn that, those hundreds into millions and billions and revolutionize that area of research. Another key thing that's happening is a convergence of technologies, modern technologies such as this advanced FPGA board, all the techniques that we used to use decades ago that were separate and independent for all the different applications, they are converging technologically and now we use the same devices across all of our research. So that is bringing new capabilities, it's also bringing all the different aspects of Haystack's activities together. You may have heard on the news that MIT and, and Haystack uh, now have a role on the upcoming Mars 2020 rover, in particular the MOXIE instrument on board that rover, which is designed to manufacture oxygen from the CO2 atmosphere 
of Mars in preparation for future human exploration. That's uh, something that's being led by, by Mike Hecht here. We're also looking at moving into measure, measuring, doing radio science from space, in particular using CubeSats. These are very small satellites that are relatively inexpensive, both to build and to launch, and we are working with uh, colleagues on campus and at Lincoln Laboratory to try and turn such constellations of satellites into a reality. And we're also working on matters of climate change. So this is actually uh, some data spanning 50 years using those incoherent scatter radars that I talked about earlier and learning about not just how the climate changes here on the ground, but how it changes 300 kilometers up in the atmosphere. So all of that is very exciting and paints a very bright future for Haystack Observatory. But of course, Haystack started with the 37 meter dish. And that, uh, as you saw from Eric's presentation, was, a, was the subject of a phenomenal upgrade operation, uh, peaking in 2010 when all of those crane lifts happened. And here is a couple of photographs. And what you're seeing here is the radome being uncapped. And what's underneath is the old Haystack dish, the one that Herb Weiss built. And it, shortly after this photograph was taken, it was lifted out of the radome, set aside, and turned into scrap, which, about which many tears were shed. It was the end of a remarkable and amazingly productive instrument. But oh my goodness, what it was replaced with. This is the new haystack antenna from an astronomer's perspective quite independent of the remarkable radar capabilities that Eric mentioned. And this is a list of all of the large telescopes in the world that are capable of millimeter wave observations in order of diameter. So what I've done here is uh, taken this list of telescopes and their surface RMS accuracies and come up with a simple figure of merit, which is the diameter of the telescope divided by the surface accuracy. The original haystack dish on this scale was about um, 0.4. All of these telescopes are much better than that. The new haystack dish has a 37 meter diameter and a 75 micron RMS, which gives it a figure of merit of just about half a million on this scale. There's only one other telescope in this entire list that is higher than that. That's this one here, the Iran telescope, 30 meter uh, in, in Europe, in southern Spain. So this is truly a remarkable, world-class, state-of-the-art antenna, not just for the radar, it is the highest resolution imaging radar in the world, but also we hope for uh, an exciting future of astronomical research using a phenomenal instrument. So um, I would like to uh, close at this point with, uh, with thanks to uh, many people who've uh, contributed to the success of this, uh, this celebration. Uh, most importantly, uh, the committee that has been meeting now for several months to bring everything together, a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to give a round of applause to, uh, to all of those committee members. I also want to acknowledge the generous support of both uh, Maria Zuber and the Vice President's Office uh, and uh, Lincoln Laboratory for, for supporting uh, this event. Um, and most of all, I want to thank the broader Haystack community across boundaries of both time and research mission, um, which has made Haystack something special indeed. Uh, so with that, I will just put back up the map of the site here uh, and invite everybody to wander around, look at all the exhibits, partake of a slice of cake and refreshments and uh, view this marvelous instrument uh, that has been so superbly constructed here. So thank you very much and have a good time.